Enter the Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Bath Mayo Experience. Experience. Welcome to the Pat Mayo Experience presented by DraftKings 2022 PGA Championship player by player breakdown. DraftKings picks, bets, DraftKings ownership. Should you put them in your core group of players? I'm thinking yes or no. I'll talk it through with Mr. Run Good himself. Rick Gaiman from rickrungood.com at rickrungood on Twitter. The Rick Run Good YouTube channel. What's up, dude? Uh, not much, Pat. Yeah, good to be good to be back with you. Feels like we blinked and we have another major championship. We get the opportunity to talk through almost every single one of these golfers. Always a good time. I highly disagree. A, you don't have kids. So time just, I mean, time flies, but it doesn't at the same time. And we just dealt with four straight weeks of the worst stretch of golf of the year in terms of talking about golf. Like these tournaments were garbage. I thought you were going to say, uh, I disagree. I don't like to go player by player through the board. That's that's the angle that I thought you were taking there. <laughs> no, untrue. I want to remind everyone to smash the like out there. Share the wealth around. Retweet the show. Share it on the Facebooks. Make a TikToks if that's something that you do. I'm too old for that. Although I'm probably not. I probably should do that. But hey, I got no time on my hands anymore. Uh, but please do that. And then if you want to get into the draw for 100 bucks cold hard cash not just one there'll be multiple winners of this rate and review and subscribe to the pat mayo experience audio podcast on apple Podcasts or spotify juice those numbers i am yes bribing you so we get more downloads more exposure so i can charge more for advertising and we continue to bring this show to you for free something that's not free fantasynational.com but if you use slash mayo at the end, you'll get 20% off. So that's pretty good. You get ownership projections, all the stats you want, customized model, lineup generator, simulations. It is all up there. Fantasynational.com slash mayo. Sub to the newsletter as well. That'll be coming out every single night. It has been coming out every single night during major weeks with new research, updated info, injury reports, everything that you need, plus some exclusive shows that are not out as of yet with myself, Toe Tag and Tambo, and Ben Raza. So you might want to peep the news newsletter to go check that out share that around as well help us out uh, these are the big weeks for all of us within the golf content space and the more eyeballs that we can get the better it is for everyone because that means more content better content probably not for me other people uh, you'll get like the same content for me but that's always goes again the longest way to helping us out to help rick out i mean i, I think andy had jeff on the show this week didn't he uh, yeah, that sounds about right. And and you're absolutely right, Pat. Just it's very simple. Support the people that you like support the things that you enjoy, because a lot of the ways that we ask you to support are free and we take it takes like five seconds of your time. So, uh, yeah, share it around, subscribe, do all that fun stuff. Um, it, it matters, unfortunately. Right. But it, it's it's the truth. It is. And the bigger thing is we need to fill this listeners league. It is 68 percent full at the moment. Still two full days to go on the listeners league on. On DraftKings. The link is down in the description. Three max entry, $15 to play. There is $90,000 of rake free guaranteed money in the prize pool. We're just over 4,000 right now, so we still have 2,000 to go. So if you've been on the fence, please go do that so we can jam it up. We still have room to grow for the U.S. Open. So if we fill this one, we'll get the $100,000 of rake free guarantee. It is the best tournament on DraftKings by far. It's not even close. So let's go play in that. Okay, thank you. Let's go to the board. Highest price player, number one player in the world. Scotland Scheffler is $11,400 on DraftKings. He is 12 to 1 at DraftKings Sportsbook. To win this tournament, he put the fear of God into me, as I was telling Feinberg uh, on the in the final round at the Byron Nelson, when, you know, he played the hardest hole, that long par three, just put it to like 12 feet, no problem, made the putt. You see him on 18, this like really weird, really tight lie, like we're going to see a lot of this week at Southern Hills. It just absolutely gasses it at the hole. I'm like, oh my God, he put it over the green. Nope, it just stopped right next to it goes and taps it in for birdie I was like if he does that next week he's gonna run away with this this isn't good it's so much money to pay for him and he's worth it obviously based on his performance but can he really win like is this Tiger Woods in 2000 is he gonna win five times in the first five months that seems crazy it does seem crazy this is kind of one of those like roulette situations where you know black has hit five times in a row and you're like, well, it can't happen again. I, I honestly really don't think that anything we've seen from Scotty Scheffler um, impacts him 
for this week. He gave a really good uh, post uh, round presser when he won the Masters, where he's just like, "Yeah, you know what? I just I just go it out and play golf. Like I don't I try not to make it that big of a deal. It doesn't infiltrate my personal life." And he's kind of lived up to that. So I don't think he envisions it as a historic pace, a tiger esque pace or anything like that. You mentioned that low spinny chipper that he hits. It's, it's unreal, man. His short game is absolutely phenomenal. And that's only when he needs to use it. Cause he's one of the best approach players that we have on tour this year. I mean, he's just firing on all cylinders. The combination of, of him and Ted Scott has been uh, nothing short of spectacular. I, I, I cannot find a reason to not be excited about Scotty Scheffler, even though he is the most expensive golfer on the slate. How do you think he's going to rate out in terms of ownership projections here? Because uh, just looking at the first five, and we might as well get this out of the way now, I'm seeing Justin Thomas, probably the highest owned of the 10K guys, Morikawa, the lowest owned of the 10K guys. Then you have Scheffler, Rom, and Rory, all probably right around the same. How do you think that breaks? Yeah, I've got the same thing. Um, and and the good news about this field is it's it's incredibly it's incredibly deep. So I don't think any one golfer sucks up a lot of the ownership. JT, I think in the 10K range, as you mentioned, Pat, that's the most logical solution. Here's the other thing: Scotty's not sexy. Uh, like the winning's cool, but like when you get an opportunity and a lot of casual fans come in and they start building lineups and they can get a cheaper Rory McIlroy, a cheaper John Rahm, a cheaper Justin Thomas, a cheaper everybody because he's the most expensive golfer on the slate. If you ask me, is that ownership coming in higher or lower than 16%? I think it's lower. Like I wouldn't be surprised to see it at 14. Uh, and we're starting to split hairs here, but I just don't think we're going to get um, this late rush to get Scotty into a lot of lineups. Fantasy National currently has him projected at 14.5%. However, Fantasy National users are using him at a 19% clip. So we're right around somewhere in that range. I actually think he comes in higher than John Rahm. I think he comes in lower than Rory, lower than Thomas, higher than Rahm, and then way higher than Morikawa. I think that's how it breaks out, but we still have, what, like 35 hours to go before first? A lot, of, a lot of minds can be changed over that time. And these are always the weeks, where, especially when pricing comes out so early and then ownership projections come out so early that the ownership projections then start to become aware. They start to become aware of themselves and people start to act on the ownership projections. So there is kind of an ebb and flow to this. Uh, John Rahm might be the guy who's kind of left at a lower ownership that shouldn't be, but there's, there's still a lot of evolution with a couple of days to go. It's a living, breathing organism the ownership projections it's like the terminator essentially like they've learned they've become self-aware it's not great news skynet taking over DraftKings golf are you going to be using scotty scheffler in your lineups because i'm on the fence he's ander cursed that's not good news i'm leaning towards no right now and i don't feel good about it uh, I, I like the other side of it there. Okay. So I, I just think he's probably the safest guy, right? There's, there's so there's two clear paths for someone to finish inside the top 10. In my opinion, it's be really good with your irons or be really good on and around the green. Scotty covers both of those. Uh, it's a smaller sample size than most in major championships, but his last seven major championships, he's got what seven consecutive top twenties. The moment has never been too big for him. Even before he started to win. Now he is, uh, arguably the best golfer on the planet, or at least the hottest golfer golfer on the planet. So I, I cannot uh, say that I will not be using him. I think he's going to be in quite a few of my lineups here. John Rahm is $200 less, the second most expensive player. And I do think that his ownership is finally going to take a tumble, which is strange because he won pretty recently, although no one really gives him much credit for beating a corn fairy tour group of players in Mexico, but he's still done it. He's still been really good. It's just, it's funny the standard that we hold John Rom to uh, versus a lot of other players that it just seems to be so elevated. That's how people think of him, that they think he's so good because he is so good that when he's not constantly churning out four wins during a season, it's like, oh yeah, he sucks now. But everyone just kind of looks at it and be like, hmm, if he's coming in a bit lower, maybe I'll just use John Rahm and try to get sneaky. And that probably ends up inflating his ownership back up. I currently do not have John Rahm in my lineups either. Fading the, the top two people, maybe a bit more as well, because I think I want to get very concentrated at the top. And it does feel to me like Scheffler will burn me more than Rahm. At least that's the impression that I have going into it. So if I'm not playing Scheffler, I'm not going to play Rahm. I understand the sentiment. Uh, John Rahm's certainly going to be less owned than Scotty Scheffler. Uh, Rahm has not lost strokes off the tee since the 2019 Tour Championship. 2019, not a typo. That's a real <laughs> thing. And he's finally broken through that little mini slump where he was struggling around the green. He was struggling with the putter. He's now gained strokes with the putter in three straight. This, to me... 
um, is a really sneaky way to to kind of deploy John Rahm this week is to is to roll him out at the PGA Championship because Phil has sucked up all the oxygen, Tiger has sucked up all the oxygen, Jordan Spieth, Scotty Scheffler, John Rahm hanging here like what the heck, guys? Wasn't I the number one player in the world for over a year? So I will probably build. Um, a lot of my lineups will have either Scotty or John Rom in it. I think I'd prefer to stay away from the rest of the 10K range. Uh, so these two are going to be a pretty big staples for for me moving forward. Okay, no, well, this is a, so you're going to stay away from the rest of them. Justin Thomas is up next per the numbers that I ran at FantasyNational.com. Number one player in the field. By my numbers, I'm also not playing Justin Thomas at $10,700. Just feel like he's he's probably going to be the highest owned of all these guys. That's a good differentiator for me. And when I take a look at the guys right below him, I think you can cluster a lot of these players together in terms of what their skill sets are, how you envision that they end up doing, what are the real differences between their win equity or top 10 equity when it comes down to it. And if this really turns into a spot where... I mean, he's been good off the tee, like really good off the tee, much better than he had been for the previous two years. And that's been a real you know, feather in his cap right now of where his game has really improved. But it's funny that we talk about, well, Rom blew it. The guy can't win. When was the last time we got to Sunday and Justin Thomas actually played like he's Justin Thomas and not wilted away? Haven't we seen that a bunch recently? But no one talks about it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's basically just a bunch of top tens and he will have one bad hole on Sunday or hit one bad shot. And that will kind of end his chances because he spends most of early Sunday flying up the leaderboard and then whole run into, uh, some issue there, the, the depth of this field, especially at the top, if Justin Thomas is going to be twice as owned as Colin Morikawa. Is Justin Thomas twice as likely to win? No. Uh, same thing goes for the arguments for Roy McIlroy and basically all these other guys. Justin Thomas uh, is playing great. He's probably going to finish inside the top 10, but the likelihood of him actually being the victor of this tournament is not the same as what the sentiment is around him that is creating this high ownership uh, projection. So this is more of a, a game theory thing. I love JT. He's awesome, but I, I, I don't think this is the place to roll him out at this week's PGA Championship. I do believe that he'll be the highest owned above $10,000, and I do believe that he'll be double Morikawa. Now, like I mentioned, he was number one in the stats model. Go to the Fantasy National Win Simulator. He has the highest expected odds of win equity to win this event. It's just over 9%, which is a pretty huge number considering some of the names in this field. The next closest is Rom at 6.7% for anyone who is inquiring about that to get the rest of them fantasynational.com slash mayo but that's what the thousand simulations of this tournament actually reveal so if you're convinced justin thomas is going to win there's no ownership too high then you have to have him in your lineup if you want to win one of these giant tournaments for me I can build a pretty compelling case for Colin Morikawa right below him. I'm betting Colin Morikawa to win this tournament. I bet him to win basically every tournament that he plays in because I love Colin Morikawa. And I think this really does play to his skill set because I don't think his skill set is all that different than Justin Thomas's, to be perfectly honest with you. Yes, if one of them has to get it up and down from 30 yards... It's going to be Justin Thomas, but we have seen Morikawa enough times, especially on, not out of the rough, out of these close, closely shaved fairway chips. He's done really well at courses like that. We even see it Riviera chipping in from off the fairway. We remember the PGA Championship. Even we remember last year trying to get it up and down, although he didn't have to do it all that often. At the Open Championship, those tight lies are where he prefers to chip from rather than being in the deep rough or just even in the semi-rough, just trying to fluff it up there. I mean, that's what Justin Thomas does the best. Not that Justin Thomas doesn't do that well as well. And the big difference to me is we're going to know with Morikawa basically by the end of Thursday. Has he had, does he have these greens figured out or doesn't he? Because if he does, he could gain like seven strokes putting. We've seen this. Justin Thomas just doesn't feel like he's in that stratosphere anymore. Yeah, very good uh, popping ability with that putter. You know, when you start talking about major championships and obviously everything besides Augusta, uh, besides the Masters, you know, being played at different golf courses over the last, what is that, 14 years. So dating back to 2008, everybody in this field, Colin Morikawa is the best in major championships. He's gaining over 2.1 strokes per round. That is obviously a much smaller sample size than a lot of these guys like Brooks Kepka, who's second, and Zal Torres and Scotty Scheffler. But his last, what, six majors? T18, T8, fourth, a win and a fifth. That doesn't even include the other win, Pat. So this, there is no stage that's too big for him. I will say um, th you have to draw a line here because statistically he is uh, the worst around the green player in the 10K range. Statistically, he's the worst putter going back last 24 rounds. And, but by, a lot and by far the lack of distance versus the other guys too. 
Correct. Now there is a big differentiator and I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, the tight lies. I, I actually believe he's better in tight lies. He's better out of the sand than some of his, than some of his peers are. And a lot of these bad numbers that you're getting around the green are from places where it's just that thick, nasty, grab your club rough. So you've got to be really careful with that. Um, I will probably not get to Morikawa because I'm living with, I'm, I'm living with Scotty and I'm living with John Rom. but uh, I'm, this is the one I'm most worried about not being a big part of. And I mean, that they would kind of go through with that too. Like there's going to be a lot of these runoff areas and there's someone in particular we're going to talk about here in a few names where this has become a really big debate. And I think you're the perfect guy to talk about it because like, you know, he's your pal. So yeah, you might have some good insight to this, but with Morikawa, I worry about the distance becoming a factor and where this is such a long course, but he's going to hit more fairways than basically anyone else at the top of the board. And if that ends up, I mean, that could be a mitigating factor in terms of distance. Yeah. If, if Rom is driving it long and straight, no one's going to outdrive him. Maybe DJ uh, or Bryson, if he ends up playing and he hits the ball on the number every single time and hits it down the middle. But where we know that Morikawa is likely to hit the fairway more often than not, especially versus a lot of these guys, he's going to get significant rollout if it's playing firm and fast. And I don't think it's crazy to think we're back on bent grass, fast bent grass, which is like the one spot where he actually putts well. I completely agree. And I would actually argue for someone like Colin Morikawa, he's not short off the tee. It's just not as long as everybody else. The way that the Southern Hills is laid out, a lot of the yardage is in the fives and in the threes. There's only, I believe, one par four that's over 500 yards. Contrast that to what we saw in Mexico a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> where there were, what, four or five of those par fours that were over 500. So there are still going to be a lot of fours that are driver uh, wedge or driver nine iron, just driver short iron for everybody, especially Morikawa. So I'm not even as worried about the lack of distance there as I am about some of the short game and then putting woes that he might encounter. He started to drift down the betting board as well. You can find him as deep as 22 to one in some spots. I'm hoping out for a 25. I'll bet. The, I was going to bet the 18. I see the 20, I see the 22 now. So hey, I'll continue to wait. If I, if it goes back up to 20, then I'll have to eat that. That's okay. I will be betting him to win. But in terms of DraftKings, he might be like 9% owned. That seems pretty good to me. Yeah, and and can contrast that against some of the other guys, right? Like nine percent versus a JT who might be twenty one or twenty two. It's just it's just like, come on, if you're trying to win a million bucks, um, the path is is likely through Colin Morikawa more so than Justin Thomas. I think so as well. I mean, unless Justin Thomas wins, then we're all kind of screwed for us fading Justin Thomas. But there's a couple names down the board, especially in the nines, that I just think it becomes an ownership play with a lot of this stuff, and you just might be wrong and lose all your money. That can happen. Whenever I play the ownership, don't play the ownership, I'm no stranger to losing all my money. So I don't really care about, you know, is that the bad decision? No, I'll try to make what I think is statistically the proper decision. Go with that. If I lose, I lose. If I win, at least I feel, if it hits, at least I feel like I have a better chance to win uh, And after I've boxed out most of the field. Rory's next. Fade and Rory. Maybe the move is just to bet against him in round one and then just bet on him in his round or by round matchups in rounds two, three, and four. That usually works out in majors with Rory. Uh, no, there's nothing pointing to Rory not having a good week. He should have a really good week, but just feel like he, I know he came second at the Masters, but you know, he never really had a chance to win. You would take the second. You would take the second this week, obviously, but I don't know what it is with me. It's just I, I'd rather play Morikawa, and then when I get to the nines, there's guys who I have deemed as equal who are going to be far lesser owned. Yeah, fairly neutral on Rory. Uh, I think he's. I think he's fine. I think that he uh, that Masters performance it, it, it kind of inflates a couple of things. It inflates our perception of him. Where you're right, he he never contended. I mean, Scotty Scheffler four putts the final hole, right, and still wins easily. Right? Like like Rory was never going to win that Masters, and he also gained like five and a half strokes around the green on Sunday, which inflates those numbers, and it inflates his like last twenty four round stuff. So um, I think Rory is probably better suited for Southern Hills than a lot of other golf courses. Uh, but I, you're right; there's guys who are priced higher that I like more. There's guys that are priced lower that I like more. I'm I'm so neutral on Rory that. At this point, when you're trying to build lineups and you're trying to take stands, like I, I don't have a stand to, to make on him. I would say, I think you kind of hit on it that it's not that I don't like Rory. There's guys, and it's not even like guys I who are lower priced than him that I like more. There's guys lower priced than him that I like the same that are going to be far lesser owned. So obviously, I'm just going to take those guys instead. Starting with your boy, and this is where the debate comes in. I love Victor this week. I'm going to bet Victor to win this tournament. And the main reason is you're not going to get the same sort of floor. 
with Victor. I mean, you might in DraftKings scoring because he'll probably score even at a course where no one is scoring because that's kind of what he does. But you're playing for peak performance here. And realistically, besides the chipping, which is what we're going to talk about, there's no difference between Rory and Victor at all. Yeah, how much time do I have on on Victor here? This could this could take a while. Um, so he is very aware of his shortcomings, and he's very aware of his shortcomings statistically. He um, and I know he's been out there a couple of five or six times over the last couple of weeks playing Southern Hills, and he knows that the way that they've shaved down these greens instead of being thick rough, that is not good for him. Now, what he knows is good for him is that he's one of the best drivers on the planet and he's one of the best second shot players on the planet. And he's been playing in those Oklahoma wins all summer long. He's been out at Southern Hills getting acquainted with it. Uh, I I wish they've left some of those trees in there for him, uh, but he (laughs) is he's just going to have to beat it a different way, Pat. So like when you talk about, when you talk about the paths to victory, I, I think it's like elite short game or elite iron play, which is why Scotty's scary because he kind of covers both of those. Victor has one path. The path that he has is really, really wide. If that happens, if he starts pounding greens and he starts playing uh, from position a off the T he's going to be very, very dangerous. Um, there's, there's going to be a problem where if this turns into a short game situation and he's playing from these uh, well-guarded greens from the bunkers or from these tight lies, that's where things get a little bit hairy, but uh, he has a path and, and that path, at least one of them is quite wide. I guess I would say that if it turns into a chipping contest for him, he was never going to win anyway. That's not how he's going to win. Then, then we're just and wrong. It's, it's, and it's not how it's, it's it's how he's never he's never won that way, right? So you're right. Um, and he's he's been a prolific winner over the last two years, and he's done it just differently than everyone else. And I just think that he gets a bad rap on having a bad short game, which is not really true. He's 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 a bad chipper. He's a bad pitcher. He's a good. Points, he, he's great. been a, he's been a great putter this year great putter and he's got one of the most consistent putting strokes on tour like when they measured it at ping he basically broke broke the machine it's a very very consistent stroke so yes i don't lump uh around the green play into short game for him and you're right if if we're relying on short game he he, or or around the green play he he probably wasn't going to win it well there's another piece to this as well where everyone is talking about how critical short gameplay and chipping is going to be. We've talked about the runoff area, so it might not necessarily be a 30-foot chip from the rough. It might be a 65-yard up and down after your ball rolls down a hole from a very tight line. Not to say that he's great at that, because he's not. But, whereas if we were playing out of the rough and there was a backstop for the ball and these elite Justin Thomas type short game players are able to get it up and down and put it to a foot. That's an easy tap in. Now Vic is probably not doing that. He's probably just going to leave it to eight feet and maybe he'll make the putt. Maybe he won't. But at this course, you're probably not going to see a lot of guys end up like six inches from the hole for the easy tap. And they're going to be left with five to 10 footers for that power. Even if they are on the high end where Vic has his 13 to 15 footer, if that's the case, then a lot of guys aren't going to be scrambling for par. There's going to be bogeys, at least with Vic. And Rory's very much in the same conversation with this. They're going to make their birdies and that's going to count for something. There, he is the reverse. Uh, Victor is the reverse Hideki that we've seen over the years. So Hideki was very good around the green, bad putter. So what that means is he would hit these chip shots to four feet, and then he'd miss the putts. Victor's kind of the opposite. He's gonna hit. He's gonna hit his pitches and chips to like six feet, seven feet, but he's gonna make more of those than his peers. So it's kind of the reverse Hideki. Um, I'm I'm quite bullish on him. Listen, I know he's been out there. I've been texting with him. He loves the setup. It's it's going to be challenging. It's going to be windy. He was not happy with his play at the Masters in the last couple of times that we saw him. He's been working hard. I uh, removing the connection to him aside. I'm I'm quite bullish on him. The other thing to look at too is that the prevailing narrative is that he can't chip and people aren't using him at all. And, like, there's vitriol coming back. Like, even that I put out that I'm betting him this week. Like, I in our Golf Digest column, I put out that I'm betting him. And I might be completely wrong. He might come in dead last. He might chip himself out of the tournament. That is a completely easy situation to envision. I can see it. But I do think that if he bring and you these guys need to play their A game, A-plus game to win a major. And if he does that, I'm not concerned about it. If he doesn't have it, then, like I said, he was never going to win anyway. But I do think that he has that elite upside. He's drifted down the board. Now we're looking at an ownership percentage that's like 8%. Morikawa and Hovland together is a pretty elite start, to tell you the truth. 
Yes. And uh, I think the, the best, the best evidence is go look at his best finishes, go look at his wins. They're not one uh, uh, via the around the replay, which is, which is what I think we've, we've got here. And now, yes, the, I, I saw the, I saw the vitriol towards, towards Victor's short game from that golf digest article. It's too low. You can't have a guy who's got what, however many wins he does in the last 15 months uh, at, at 8% here at a place that for the vast majority of the shots he's going to hit, uh, he's going to be way better than the field, right? Like how many, how many around the green situations is he going to have? If he misses, if he misses, and I don't know what they're going to do. Like if he misses five greens a day, six greens a day, six, 12, 18, 24 shots, when it's probably going to take two seventy or something to win it, like less than 10% of his strokes. And you just hope he rides the hot putter. Cause that's a part of this too. He has to putt well, if he has any chance of winning. So if he starts making these eight footers, I mean, we saw Cameron Smith do it. Yeah, that, exactly right. Exactly. They're just they're just playing different games in the spreadsheet. It doesn't look great. If you watch Victor in some spots, it doesn't look great, but he's legitimately that much better than everybody else in the other three facets, or at least in two of them. Cameron Smith is up next, and I had no intentions of playing Cameron Smith at $9,700. I was just kind of, I've been all in on Spieth basically since the Masters. I got him at the Heritage. That turned out really well. I bet him last week. Didn't turn out so great. If he could just make a five-foot putt on number 10, all of a sudden we're talking about Spieth as the winner coming into this. No one seems to be too concerned because the ball striking is off the charts with Jordan Spieth. But realistically, if you give me a 1v1, like, what would be, do you think, is the, uh, like, it, throwing out, like, what the public perception is? Because these two guys are back-to-back, 97 and 9,600, with Cameron Smith and Jordan Spieth. If you had to set a realistic head-to-head matchup price for them, what do you think that would be and who would be favored? Oh, um, well, I, Cam Smith should be the favorite. Yes. Uh, and he should be, like, minus, like, 130. And when we look at the ownership percentages, Cameron Smith might be one-third the ownership of Jordan Spieth. Yeah, we're, we're getting full on uh, Spieth lather, right? Everybody's hot and bothered, and they should be, right? When you get the narrative of the career Grand Slam, when you get the win at the Heritage, when you get the, the runner-up finish last week that he probably should have won at the Byron Nelson, when you get the fact that he's not even putting all that well, he's kind of put himself out of some of these tournaments, you can see the ceiling there. But uh, when you run this tournament a thousand times, Spieth might win it more than Smith, but I'm not even sure about that, right? Smith's been so good, but um, like... Th- in a large percentage of those outcomes, Smith is just going to have a better finish than Spieth is just because he's more consistent. Uh, he's just been much better right over a longer period of time. The, the attributes that we expect to be important this week, the second shot, also the, the short game, that's Cam Smith. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty compelling to forego Spieth for Smith at the moment. Yeah, and I had been committed to playing Jordan Spieth here, but I just think that the love is just, it's not that it's undeserved out of control, but it is out of control. And Cam Smith is a player that, yeah, he wilted a little bit on Sunday at the Masters. But other than that, he's having like the best year besides Scotty Scheffler. <laughs> yeah, and he can get a little loose with the driver at times, which as long as you're not in one of those creeks that runs kind of alongside a lot of these fairways. Like they got rid of a lot of the trees out there when they did this, uh, when they did this redesign or this restoration, it's, it's more wide open. Now it's actually probably a better setup than a lot of other major championship venues we could have gotten for Cam Smith. Yeah. And if this does become the opposite, like I'm not going to play Smith with Victor or with Morikawa. I don't think that makes any sense in the way that I construct my lineups, because if Cameron Smith is winning, it's probably going to be an elite iron week for him an elite putting week, or it's like the Patrick Reed style. Like I think Cameron Smith would be a nice pair. Like if you don't, if you want to play Justin Thomas and Jordan Spieth, just make a few lineups that are Smith Spieth or Thomas Smith instead of going Thomas Spieth, which is probably going to be the most common start. Because if it's that type of player that you want to win this tournament, Cameron Smith is in that grouping with them. He's not the elite ball striker that some of these other guys are. No, you're you're absolutely right, but he still is, you know, phenomenal from Tita Green, rarely loses strokes there. That putter is is lightning at times. I, I agree. He is um so you know, in our industry, there's a lot of different ways to deploy these guys. I don't necessarily want to deploy Jordan Spieth in a lot of DFS situations. I'd rather do other things with him. Uh Cam Smith is like the guy you want to deploy in DFS because of all the things that we just talked about and the seemingly fractional ownership that you're getting uh compared to some of his peers here. Well, can you give us some inside of what you would like to do with Jordan Spieth, Mr. Rick? Uh, um, I don't think I want to play him in DFS. Or if I do, you got. I think you have to be really creative, right? Like what you mentioned, start Smith 
uh, Spieth. Okay, cool. Now, now I'm much more interested in that. You could not get me to start this Justin Thomas, Jordan Spieth. It just doesn't make any sense, especially with the range of outcomes of, of Jordan Spieth. So I would almost rather bet Spieth outright. I'd rather get access to him in, I don't know, uh, top five markets, top 10 markets, uh, playing him at 22 ish percent with all the other guys here. It, it's, it's not as exciting. I Listen, I can see it. I went into this week wanting to play Spieth, and the ownership got a bit out of control. I think that everything that you look at, everything that we model out, when you just watch him on the course, that this should be a great week for Jordan Spieth. He is the one sort of non-bomber, although <laughs> all of a sudden he's figured out how to hit a driver over the past month, which is a huge boon to his game. If he could figure out how to make a few four-foot putts, it would be a little bit better for his overall outcome. But you know that can flip at any time, especially when we're getting a lot of Augusta National comparisons to these green complexes, to these greens in general. And we know how well he generally puts on those. This this year, notwithstanding, historically does very well on this type of surface. So I think that there's every reason in the world to play Jordan Spieth outside of the fact that you know, if you don't play him and he does not do well, you're now only playing against 75% of the field. Correct. He's gained over 10 strokes uh, from tee to green in three of his last four starts. You've got the Augusta vibes. You've got obviously a ceiling he hasn't tapped into yet because the putter has not come around. It is literally only the ownership uh, and the guys around him that kind of that kind of worry me. I'd rather bet him outright than play him uh, in fantasy or or get creative, Pat. I liked what you said about Smith and Spieth. Start different, get creative if you really need to get access to him. Well, you could do that. You could go Smith, Spieth, or you say, I don't want Cameron Smith. I want Jordan Spieth. Well, then just play him with Dustin. Dustin Johnson. J Dustin, I haven't made the call yet. I've seen him as low as 30 to 1 now, and I think I might have to take it because I, I can't believe I've written this and wasn't like not serious about it. I was dead serious. You can get Dustin Johnson, who is essentially a discount Scotty Scheffler right now, if you can get four rounds at him. We haven't seen those four rounds materialize for the recently married Dustin Johnson in a very long time. But on paper, when you look at Southern Hills, doesn't this feel like a peak DJ wins course? Yeah, DJ has a lot of different ways to get there this week, which I think is exciting. The the elite uh, ball striking and especially the the off the tee stuff like that's back. You know, he went through a little bit of a of a slump there at the end of 2021. That was a little bit concerning. Uh, he's starting to figure out the the short game a little bit. He's not as good of a putter in recent uh, weeks that he has been kind of longer term, but he's capable of gaining three or four strokes with the putter over the course of a week. That stuff is is really hard to predict. We can also translate the Augusta National vibes and undulation on these greens to someone like Dustin Johnson, who has a green jacket in the closet. So so yes, this I would be 0% surprised uh, if Dustin Johnson won the PGA Championship. And even when you look at putting, and I did the breakdown with Brandon DeGula on the Pat Mayo experience last week about whether it's predictable or not, and basically it's not, but there is more of a lean between 5 and 15 feet. That tends to be more consistent than anything else, unless you're Jordan Spieth, who makes like one of every two 74-foot putts somehow, yet misses the four-footers. When we look at the aggregated putting over the past 50 rounds, from 5 to 15 feet, Dustin Johnson is still the best of anyone above, down to Sam Burns is where you would have to go until someone is better than him at the elite level. Yeah, and I mean, it's just so... Like he's capable of getting so hot, which not a lot of guys are like there. He could stand over every putt over the course of a week and it looks like he's going to make everything and, and he does start making everything. And if that's really the only question that I have, because I no longer have concerns off the tee, I don't really have any concerns on approach. I don't have any mental concerns. I don't have any concerns about anything other than is he going to make enough putts to win? And even in this, you know, elongated 24 rounds in which he hasn't been as good as like his previous 40 he's still been pretty good and he still has really good weeks which is kind of the path to how you win golf tournaments you just have these pop ceiling weeks with one skill set or another usually with the putter and that's what dj's showing us i love dj i love him at ninety five hundred dollars i don't know i'm not gonna lock button dj but he'll probably be in at least 50 percent of my lineups and i think i'm playing 50 to 100 this week so that's where i stand on dustin johnson as a DraftKings play at ninety five hundred bucks xander is up next ninety three hundred bucks I shall be taking a pass on Mr. Shoffley from basically everything that I've seen from him. Yeah, he was able to rally at the Bunny Ranch. That's great for him. Uh, if you want to go out and have a shit first round at the PGA Championship, you're probably not going to rally back with minus 11s on the weekend. I'm with you here. Um, 
I see it, right? Like I'm, I'm excited too that over the final three rounds, he was great at Byron Nelson. This is a completely different setup. I have to start crossing names off the, off the list here. Eventually. When I look at Xander Shoffley, I still see a guy who is basically tour average with his putter over his last five or six starts. He's basically tour average around the green in his last five or six starts. Both of those areas. Um, he has historically been, been better at the off the tee and approach. He's had good and bad weeks. I'm just seeing for the first time in a long time, a much more inconsistent version of Xander. And he was generally a uh, rock solid gain across the board type of guy. You're ge- almost guaranteed to see him on the first page of the leaderboard. And then you hope he does enough to kind of tr- to win or do, or, or make a lot of noise. I, I don't, I don't see the same, same stat profile from him uh, kind of in the last couple of months. So I will also be um, scared, but not be playing much Xander here. I think that's a great way to put it. Scared, but not playing him. You can only play so many people. And the one thing that I was surprised about, and maybe this is, and listen, the as you mentioned, the ownership projections are living, breathing. They're always adapting, especially with how early that they came out. He's projected right now around 13%. I just know what's going to come in higher than that. Uh, like a million percent. Yeah. Like I would, I would bet, uh, I don't know, a sizable sum. It's going to come in over 13, over 13%. He's just so popular. He's a household name. The Americans always get a boost when we get to like Millie maker type events. If you click the logs, you're going to see a couple of, of good finishes. Oh, he won the Zurich classic. Oh, he, he, he finished, you know, top five at, at uh, last week's Byron Nelson. Like he must be playing well. It's like, yeah, kind of, but also kind of not. It's a weird situation and we can't play everybody. And with Dustin, I didn't mention it. He might be like 7% owned. No one's playing Dustin. Yeah, just there's just so many names. And, um, you know, I don't what, like when's the last time Dustin won? Was it the Masters? Was it, that his it, last it, it was. It was the Fall Masters. Yeah. So it's been a while, which when you've got every other top player basically at the peak of their game, it, it, it's he's just like the overlooked elite at the moment. Hideki is up next. Uh, He's no longer injured. We found that out last week. That was good information to have. Now everyone's on board with Hideki, and it makes a lot of logical sense. Tita Green, he's on bent. That is his best putting surface, as we've seen. And the putter's actually been a lot better than it historically has been. Uh, Even over the past 24 rounds, he's 44th in this field, which seems like a big reach for Hideki, but normally it's like, oh yeah, he's basically like better Luke List, like when you look at his long career profile, (laughs) Uh, but all of a sudden the putter is not bad anymore, and we know he can scramble. We know that he can have an elite ball striking performance, and I even have to lean on that short game at all. I'm not there with him because I think the ownership is going to get out of control, but this, and where I like Dustin, and I like Cam Smith, I like Hovland, like there's only so many you can play. I do have someone that I can add in this lower 9,000 area to my pool. It's not going to be Xander. Hideki's on the short list, but I'm kind of wavering on it at the moment. So uh, personally, I'm I'm thrilled that on Thursday last week, I bet Hideki to win the PGA Championship. So I've got a nice long 45 to 1 ticket on him, so I don't have to make a lot of decisions here. But listen, it's it's awesome. Like everyone should be excited about Hideki. And this is probably the, the, if I was going to eat one chalky guy, it would probably be here in Hideki Matsuyama. He's in the midst of the best putting uh, year of his career. The elite approach stuff still there, still a great short game. You've got the Augusta uh, undulation comps. You're asking him to hit to 5,000 square feet greens that play effectively smaller than that. Uh, we saw what he did last week. We don't have any injury concern. Like I don't, I don't have a negative. I literally do not have a negative. And I, if I'm forced to play one guy over 20%, it would, it would be Hideki. What do you think are the course comps to Southern Hills? I mean, you can probably pick and choose different ones and different elements yeah. of what it might be. Cause I don't think it's dis- I mean, it is distinctly different than something like Riviera, but I think that Riviera might be a pretty good comp. Okay, I, I like Riviera. Riviera kind of asks you to hit like a lot of, um, it, well, obviously it's tough. It asks you to hit like a lot of uh, long irons, which I think you can also get kind of in situations around Southern Hills where that's the case. But it is it is fairly unique. When you look at, at, at architecture, like Perry Maxwell, the original designer, was obviously um, heavily involved with with the building and, and designing of Augusta National. So the undulation and the uneven lies, I think, are going to play a large role this week. Now, I hate to throw out comments to Kapalua because it's it's not, but like uneven lies and places that are asking you um, to play holes with a lot of different options. That That is how I oh, would. All right. So, uh, J- so TPC Deer Run, Michael Kim, if he's in the field, which he's not, going to win the PGA Championship. Got it, Rick. Thanks. 
<laughs> Easy game. Uh, but Good, like, congrats on your million. <laughs> but but I think the one thing to look at, like Riviera has such unique green complexes that you really have to figure them out. Augusta National has those too. It feels like Southern Hills falls into that category. I think that's more, and plus you have the length at Riviera. And like the Kikui is weird, but like you can miss fairways and still be like, okay, at Riviera, where I, I really wanted to link it to Mirfield Village the best I can. But I just, I think the rough is just too much there. But when it played firm and fast, two years ago when Rom won. You had like Palmer, Fitzpatrick, Willett was in the mix, Fina was in the mix. I could see it being kind of like that in terms of the the quickness that it plays at. Yeah, I think that's that's probably fair. And it's so funny because when, when we get the, the stimp readings for this week, like they're running at a 10 and that <laughs> is by tour standards very, very slow, but they're going to be way faster because the undulation, like if you're putting downhill, it's like a 14. Like it's going to be absolutely, it's going to be absolutely nuts. So yeah, it's, it's going to be firm. It's going to be fast. Um, you know, Mirfield Village has what, a lot thicker rough around the greens, but uh, otherwise uh, Southern Hills is kind of one of its own, but the, the ones we've thrown out are not bad. Well, and the bunkers are apparently quite difficult, at least that's yeah. what, as many people are saying, very tough bunkers. And that's sort of the Mirfield Village calling cards are how hard the greenside bunkers, the most difficult on tour in terms of proximity to get your ball by the hole, which really leads me to our next guy, Patrick Cantlay, who has won there twice in the past. There's a chance he's the highest owned guy this week, right? Ah, uh, man, it's, it's kind of surprising, but, but yes, I, I mean, I thought, I thought people were going to be a bit more worried about his major championship record, which, nope. which is a, <laughs> which isn't great, but they are seemingly not. And, um, and I agree, I'm not worried about it either. I was just hoping for a much, a, a much lower number on him because, uh, Cantley has shown us that he can be one of the hottest, one of the best players in the world for stretches. Um, and he could be one of the best bent putters out there. Uh, like I, I, I was excited to play Cantley. I was hoping I was going to be one of the few on it. it does not appear to be the case. I think you're getting beat by the optimizers with Cantley. I think that any optimizer that you look at for golf this week is going to tell you that per price, Cantley is the best play on the board. Yeah, and they're probably right, right? I mean, he just he just wins a lot. He contends a lot. He, he lost in that playoff to, to to Jordan Spieth, and then he won with Xander at the Zurich Classic. And many many people will tell you, Pat, that uh, he carried Xander throughout the Zurich Classic. Like, I mean, they shot fifty nine and sixty. I think they both <laughs> played pretty well. But um, yeah, I, I I agree. He's awesome. He's he's been great. It's just this major championship vibe that he hasn't gotten over yet. I am going to be going fade on Patrick Cantlay and have to live with the results on it. I'm probably going to have to as well. Cause like if I'm playing, if I'm playing Hideki and there are some other guys that I think are interesting and would I be surprised to see Cantlay finish T32 at another major? No, I wouldn't. Um, unfortunately, I, I think I'm going to have to take a pass as well. Now we get to have some fun. $9,000 Brooks Kepka who is he hurt? Probably not, but maybe we don't know. Uh, why didn't he play at the Byron Nelson? So he, um, I think it was his back. He, the, I, I knew that he had tweaked something at the masters. We, we knew about that. That existed. And I, I'm actually quite concerned because he, oh, he likes to play the week before majors or historically has played the week before a major championship. So it, it was a little bit worrisome to see him withdraw from last week's at and Byron Nelson, uh, an event that he probably would have liked to have played. So now it's been five weeks since we've seen him play competitively. I, I'm, I'm worried, Pat. I don't think I'll get there on him. Again, almost like Cantlay, if Brooks wants to show up and beat Brooks and absolutely pound this field in the submission, he's going to be doing it without me. I just can't get there with him because I do it too often. And it's just, we're living with this perception of Brooks that he's still 2018, 2019. Like on paper, you put him, you know, Go three, four years ago, he wins this by two strokes every time. He comes out and shoots 64 in the first round when the field average is 75. Like, that's who Brooks was. He just doesn't seem to be that guy right now. Has he been any good? Like, I mean, he's got some good finishes, but here, here are the big events. His last four missed cuts. The Masters, the players. Now, he was on the wrong side of the draw. Riviera and Torrey Pines. I mean, these are like some of our greatest golf courses on the schedule, our most difficult golf courses on the schedule. Brooksy's O for his last four at the big boys. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm worried, Pat. 
And the other thing as well, and you kind of hit on it with this back injury, potentially, and this is what we saw at the players, because I actually went with Brooks at the players, and I noticed that he got stuck on the bad side of the draw. I had a bunch of guys on the bad side of the draw. At least a lot of the guys, like, tried to make the cut. Once it was clear, like, the weather was too bad, he was like, fuck this, I am out of here. Yeah, we've seen him do that before, right? The week before the U.S. Open, I think it was Palmetto one year, and he was just like, fi- he was like sitting down at every tee box trying to find a way to miss this cut so he could get the hell out of town. It's, it's, I, I don't describe Brooks as a, a grinder out on tour, right? He's not going to be the guy who tries to make the cut on the number and makes a move over the weekend. He's either in it or he's not. And that's just too much for me. Um, Listen, it could shape up to be a great DraftKings play. It could shape up to be a great bet, knowing what his potential upside is. I just feel like there's too much downside to trust him in that many of my lineups. Because it's not like, hey, I'm playing 100 lineups. I'll use two lineups with Brooks. It doesn't work like that. You're not going to do that. So if I'm not able to commit 20% of my lineups to Brooks, he's just not going to make the card. So he's not making the card. Will Z is, however. I went back and looked at Brooks Kepka's lead-in form to when he ended up winning a major for the first time. Now, he had won on the PGA Tour previously to that, but it was just top 20s, top 10s, top 5s in majors. Then he goes out and just breaks through. The dam is open. He wins four of them. Scheffler, you go back and look at before the Masters. Top 20s, top 10s, top 5s, boom, he wins. Will Z is the exact same way. He has four top tens in the last six majors. He had to withdraw from the Open Championship a year ago with an injury, and he missed the cut at the U.S. Open. The harder the course, the better Will Zalatoris gets. And for as crappy as a putter as he is, he's pretty good around the greens, for one thing. And I feel like a higher score, like a minus five to minus eight, suits Zalatoris. It's when you have to make these six-foot putts to get the minus 28 that he's just not going to do it. And, and he's told us that he said, he's a, he's a big game hunter. He's a major championship guy. He does. He also thinks Pat, that his game translates better to major championships. And it's hard to argue with the results basically got his tour card because of his play at major championships when he was a non-member. Uh, I, I agree with you. Willie Z let's go. You know, the miscut last week, who cares? He it's good. Three no, that's good. Out. That's great news. Cause I'm looking at the ownership right now. It might be like 10%. Gained three strokes on approach, stunk with the putter. Awesome. That is the DNA, the blueprint. No problem there. Uh, Again, he was going to have to make a lot of birdies around TPC Craig Ranch. You're going to have to make a fraction of those around Southern Hills this week. Um, I I agree with you. Fire him up. Let's go. So here's the stat. So he's got 21 major championship rounds. Uh, He's gaining 2.05 strokes per round. It's the third most of anybody in this field behind Morikawa, behind Kepka. Obviously a small sample size, but it's not his fault that he's only played in, what, eight of these. I like it. And even when you go back and look at some of the longer courses he's played, the more difficult courses, although the Genesis didn't play quite as difficult, 26 there. Obviously lost in the playoff to list. Had a very difficult Torrey Pines on the weekend. Was leading for most of that tournament. Even the St. Jude last year, eighth. Eighth of the PGA Championship. Like, you ratchet up the difficulty, the better that he's going to get. You just pray. It's a lot like Vic. Like, you pray Vic doesn't chip himself out of the tournament. You pray that Will Zalatoris doesn't putt himself out of the tournament. But... I mean, look at his putting stats from Augusta. These fast, like, speedy bent grass greens on weird undulations. He's had no problem with those. Yeah, gained five and a half strokes putting at this year's uh, at this year's Masters in 2021. He gained 6.3. Yeah, I mean, it's... I, I could not agree more with my uh, love for, for Will Zalatoris here. It's just like, it's fire him up. Let's go. I got the bet in at 50 to 1. Thank you, EPAT, for uh, showing me where that boost was. So I'm in on that. I'd I'd still consider it a 33 to 1. It's tough just the narrative around your first win ever being a major championship. That's a tough ask. And I do think that he's a better DraftKings play than a bet this week. But I'm just going to be on board either way. Sam Burns up next. One of the lowest owned guys in the field of the top end. Yeah, so this is kind of bizarre, too, because his miscut at the Byron Nelson was a lot ugly, uglier than um, than Zal Torres's was. He lost strokes on approach. He lost strokes with the putter. Those are generally the two best parts of his game. I guess you could argue, hey, that's not normal. That's an outlier week. He'll be fine. Uh, but he also missed the cut at the Masters, Pat, which, which has been – it's it's kind of been a trend, right? Majors have not been good to Sam Burns. He missed the cut at Riviera. He missed the cut in Phoenix. He missed the cut at, at Farmers. I mean, these are, again, big boy golf courses, big time events. I'm, I'm a, I love Sam Burns. I'm a little bit worried that he is a really good PGA tour player who's going to rack up eight wins at 
Byron Nelson and Valspar and Valero, and he's going to struggle at major championships. Hope so. He is Anderkurs this week as well. He was Tim's number two pick of the week. So a pure fade for me on Sam Burns. You got to stop giving that guy multiple picks, Pat. For no, hey, we, we, we need them at the majors. Do you know who his three guys are that cannot win this tournament? Uh, oh, hold on. Let me go put this, put these bets in. Who are they? <laughs> Morikawa, Zalatoris, and Finau. <laughs> okay, let's go. Those guys, one of those guys is definitely winning. <laughs> I hope so, because I might end up betting all three of them. Not there on Finau yet, but we'll see uh, how the week turns out. Lowry, $8,700. Man, it's this is a tough fade. You were talking about eating the chalk on someone you can't just play low owned guy i mean you can play just low owned guys but i mean that's not generally how this works out some of the consensus plays are going to be good it just feels like you want to talk about floor it feels like lowry's floor is out of control right now especially for this price like can't lay hideki xander and lowry i mean it feels like they're all on the same level right now although people don't envision lowry that way yeah, because he's kind of changed the way he's played over the years. You know, he used to be kind of more of a short game specialist. Now he's just striping the ball. And he kind of coughed it up at uh, PGA National. Probably should have won uh, the Honda Classic. He played well at the... I mean, he's just been awesome. He's just been awesome. He has not lost strokes in the field since Houston. That was in November. So 2022 has been a very good year for Shane Lowry. Um, I'm... I'm probably like a six out of 10, right? I, I, I worry a little bit about the ownership and being part of like a, a, a big missed cut or something weird happening with Lowry, but the floor has been so high. I don't have any concerns. Uh, I wish he was lower owned, but I, I'll, I'll have my fair share of them. Yeah, I think that I'm going to get there with him as well. It'll either be on DraftKings or it will be with an outright bet. It probably won't be both is the weird part about it. Uh, just how I want to diversify a little bit. Plus, we're going to dig deeper into the weather live noon Eastern time on Wednesday. Tambo and I in studio as we really hammer down what the final selections are going to be because it does seem like the weather might play a factor this week. Oh, it's going to be, uh, I mean, those Oklahoma wins, especially, right? I mean, you're going to have, uh, it, it could change all the time, but like, it's it's going to be windy. It's probably going to be pretty gusty. We'll see if there's a, a significant advantage, but yeah, you're going to have to monitor it because uh, it changes all the, I've checked the weather report three times in the last three days and it's just it's some, it seems like something different every time if that's the case then maybe the move is whatever the consensus is in terms of like the t-stack just do the opposite for sure so the industry has come to a consensus uh, a couple of times recently and they've has basically been wrong on all of them right there was not a weather advantage a couple of was it last week or the week before um we we got the wrong side of it uh at the players geez, a couple, yeah at the players we got the wrong side of it it's just like yeah, take a stand on one side and probably the side that everyone thinks is the wrong side. I mean, if we're talking about leverage in terms of ownership percentage, that is, I mean, just in terms of a unique build, if you go on the other side of the weather sack, knowing that people don't know what the actual answer is going to be, you just create a ton of leverage that way. And it is really... Uh it might be the only kind of correlated way you can get guys into your lineups or obviously there's skill sets, but this isn't football where you put a quarterback and a wide receiver together. The, the biggest correlated factor during the tournament is what, what weather they have. Are, do they, are they on the wrong side of the draw? Are they on the right, right side of the draw? And more, most times there's, there's not a big enough difference, but if you get wind like this and you get gusted and there is going to be a two shot difference, like that's, it's massive. It's massive. Daniel Berger is up next. Not going to be very highly owned. Might crack 10%, but with Lowry, Hideki, and Cantley soaking up so much of this ownership in that low nine, high eight, he's just kind of being left by the wayside. Shinnecock Hills has been another course thrown around as a potential comp for this. Uh, people forget Daniel Berger tied for the lead going into the final day before Fleetwood made his run and Brooks ended up winning, but I, I kind of like Daniel Berger, but I don't love him. Uh, can you sell me on him either way? <laughs> I don't know. I was dreading this moment where we had to talk about Daniel Berger. Um, I, I think I'm out. I'm, I mean, it's hard to play guys. I'm not super excited about uh, the, the Shinnecock comp is pretty good because that Shinnecock and Southern Hills are probably two of the harder around the green spots that these guys are going to play. And, and for Berger to have a good result there is always exciting. I hated what I saw from him at the masters. He's, you know, kind of been battling a little bit of injury this year. I'm, I'm assuming he's probably healthy at the moment. I, I don't know if I could sell you, Pat. I, I think I'm just going to take a, a pass on Berger and, and play some of these other guys I like around him, but I'm very, very worried uh, that he finishes inside the top 10 without me. Well, Neiman is next. 
It seemed yeah, like he had a guy. it seemed like he had a bunch of steam and then everyone just kind of poo-pooed him after his Sunday performance at, at Byron Nelson. If we are going to look at Riviera, I've heard he's played pretty well there. Uh <laughs> over the at least so far this year he had played pretty well there. I just really like him at hard courses and I really like him in the wind. I'm playing Neiman. I'm in. This is the guy that I had that that kind of hurts the Daniel Berger side of things because um yeah the 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 fade on Sunday at Byron Nelson who cares he was awesome for 3 rounds he's been awesome all year he goes wire to wire at Riviera all good stuff uh I love that he's got all the shots Pat he's got the nine windows off the tee he keeps it low he's longer than you expect him to be he is actually not even putting as well now as he had been in the past he's historically a very good putter I'm very excited about Joaquin Neiman, uh, which kind of hurts some of the other guys around him. But yeah, like he's got he's got all the shots. I'm 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 ready to fire him up. I'm ready. Let's go. All right, I'm in. I'm in as well. And it looks like he's going to come in somewhere between ten and twelve percent. I would guess. Uh, yes, I have him at like yeah, like thirteen or something like that right now. But obviously, these are going to change over the course of the next day and a half. Well, let's get to the triage unit. Sung Jae is out, which leads us to Bryson. Bryson has a gash on his hand that basically goes from here to here with his wrist surgery. It looks like he might try to play, though. Uh, it looks like exactly where he has to hold the golf club, which is like <laughs> so so unfortunate for a guy who does this for a living. I'm like almost certain he's going to play, right? I mean, this guy's a nut, first of all. And we've seen him swinging, you know, on Instagram. Like, if he can swing a golf club, which I saw him do on Instagram, like, he's going to try to play. But it's a I'm, he, he can't have any touch, though, at this point. No, I'm, I'm, and first of all, he's lost strokes around the green three, five, uh, nine, 12, 13 straight events. So it's not like he had a lot of touch before this. Right. And, and this is probably not helping either. Um, I, I, I'm hopeful that the play that we saw from him in 2022 has been horrible. He's lost a ton of strokes off the tees, lost a ton of strokes on approach. I'm hopeful that it is because he was injured and he got that corrected. But I do not envision a world in which his first start back from the surgery with now a lot of time off and no good play in six months, that he's going to magically find it at one of the hardest courses that we go to. And it's not hard in a way that helps him. It's not wings foot where there's five inch rough everywhere. It's hard in a way that hurts him i could not possibly roster bryson in any significant way over under three percent in the millionaire maker <laughs> uh under i think he's gonna be under too paul pointed out on our betting show like you can get him at like 140 to one at DraftKings sportsbook that maybe maybe that's worth the it's a hundred to one now, I guess. I guess people people started jamming their money in on Bryson. You can find them pretty deep at some spots. Like waste ten bucks, just bet them to win, and just that that can be it for you. I was gonna say I've spent twenty dollars a lot worse ways than that. <laughs> like just for peace of mind, in case like he, he's just been rope doping us this entire time and he's fine. It was like a maybe it was like a painted on tattoo with that wrist surgery. Didn't even have wrist surgery. He's just trying to dupe the field, and then you know it's a great narrative for Bryson. Really struggled through it. Tiger's next. I'm not using Tiger. Are you? Uh, probably not for DFS. I, I like, you know, Hey, make the cut. Cool. Yeah. Stuff like that. Round by round, either, uh, matchups or props. I think he's someone that I don't want to get tied into four rounds with. I, I want to see, you know, we only have four rounds for him in the last 15 months, right? I think <laughs> it's drastically going to change after every single round. So I want that information available to me. So I can't lock myself into him for four rounds. I think he, Likely makes the cut, fades on the weekend. Because remember, the first two rounds, Pat, at the Masters, he gained like three and a half strokes on approach. Um, and I think he looks strong, but I, I don't want to. I don't want to tie four rounds still. There's also the thing too, where I mean, one of the, I mean, the biggest bet that I've made so far this year on anything was Tiger to make the cut at plus money at the Masters. Yeah. But that's the Masters. Fred Couples is out there making the cut at the Masters because he knows the course so well. I granted he has won here before the renovation, but this is a different beast. Like, yes, Augusta is long, but this seems long and like weird elevation <laughs> into the it's wind. A, it's a <laughs> Yeah, it's a different beast, but it, it is going to. So the, the one word I keep hearing from the guys that I've been texting with who have who have played it is options, Pat. This course gives you a lot of options, which is really good for thinking strategic players like Tiger Woods. And Tiger's been that way his entire career, not just the 45 plus year old version of him. So I, I do think there's a way he thinks himself 
uh, a stroke better than everybody else per round. And I'm, I'm hopeful that he can just play well for like two rounds and then see what happens. Reminder to everyone to play in the Pat Mayo Experience Listeners League. Link is down in the description. $15 to play. Three max entry. No rake. Thus making it the best tournament on DraftKings. Fill that shit. All right. Thanks. Let's go do that. Why, why wouldn't you want to play in the best tournament and make it grow with more rake-free money? You want to play, pay 15% rake? No, you want to play 0% rake in the Pat Mayo Experience Listeners League. Let's go fill that up. There's also the emotional hedge of if Tiger wins, I'm going to be happy either way. And as Jeff pointed out that me, you, anyone who does golf content will make our money back if Tiger's good. Yeah, best thing for the industry is that he's playing even better would be if he goes out and, and wins. My God, yeah, it's just like uh, just increase our cr- increase everything for us a couple of percentage points and we tip our cap again to Tiger, who is probably the reason why I have this job. Yeah, me as well. Tyrrell Hatton <laughs> is up next. No one is using old Tyrrell Hatton, but I went and looked at Shinnecock. You know who played really well at Shinnecock? Tyrrell Hatton. I like him at really tough tournaments. I know that he can get in his own way a lot of the times. And I had no real interest in playing him. But there's this weird dead range with Bryson, Tiger, Hatton, and Louie around like these other really popular chalk guys in this range. I think that Hatton is the best of the low owned guys. I don't know if I'm there yet, but I can see a path where he does really well. Because, I mean, you want to talk about a guy who can get it up and down in weird windy conditions? It's Tyrrell Hatton. So I agree with you that I think he's the best of that that low owned dead zone, but I I don't think I'll be able to play him. I, it's just, it just looks like a guy who's struggling to me. You know, two of his last three or three of his last four, he's lost off the tee. Three of his last four, he's lost on approach. Uh, he lost five and a half putting at the Masters. At the, a short game, the around the green play has been been better. That's probably been the best part of his game. It just when when you're when something else is going wrong every single week, I start to, I start to worry about that. And I start to think a guy's working through some things and hasn't really figured it out yet. Um, I, I will have to be out on, on Terrell and, um, and just live with the results. I'm, I'm thinking about it mainly hard courses. He generally does a lot better for a guy with, I mean, he doesn't have, I mean, he's above average in terms of distance, but he's not a bomber by any means, but he plays really well at long courses because his long irons are really good. One of the better players in the field from beyond 200 yards. And we know how scorching his putter can get. And I do like him in the wind, like the windier, the better for Tyrrell. Yeah, I'm with you. I mean, it's it's uh, tougher is better. I mean, we saw what he did at Bay, at Bay Hill. That's obviously, and a couple times at Bay Hill, that's obviously different, but similar. It's hard, but it's a lot of rough instead of other other things. I I see the path. I I, I just don't think I can be I can be involved in it. I think that he fits well with a Cam Smith type lineup. Like if you're stacking skills together, he's a guy that goes in with the Spieths and the Cam Smiths of the world. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. That's fair. As part of a, um, I don't want to say a stack, but yeah, part of like a skill, a skill stack. Sure. A, sk- a skill stack. Yeah. We'll go with that. Max Homa fade next. Yeah. He's just bad around the greens. Unfortunately, love, love the grinder mentality. Just this, this could, this could go sideways quickly for him. It, it could. I mean, listen, if he wasn't going to be so goddamn popular, I'd be in on him, but pe- listen, he's a victim of his own success where listen, the guy's a winner. We know this, Uh, and he can come out at hard courses, short courses, doesn't really matter. He has those skills in order to win. You don't just win at Quail Hollow and win at Riviera, and you're a bad player. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that he's just a very popular player, and put him up next to a lot of these guys, if he's going to be similar or higher owned, I'd just rather take the guys who were lower owned, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, I agree. It's a, a deficiency around the greens that he knows he has and he's working hard on and the high ownership doesn't fit, doesn't fit, the, doesn't fit the system. Now, if I'm talking about high ownership, I'm I'm thinking he comes in higher than his projection. The projection right now is somewhere between 10 and 12. I'm going to guess he's like 15. Unless, yeah. unless Corey Connors takes away all of that from him, who is the next guy up on the list. I love Connors this week, but I think realistically, unless I can get a real good gauge on how high owned he is going to be that if he's more than 15%, I think he's a fade. Connors is just the same guy every week, which I guess is good, Pat, yeah. but it's, it's, it's hard to be excited about anymore. Or it's hard. I guess it's hard to say like, why is Southern Hills better than X other golf tournament? You know what I mean? Like he is one of the best ball strikers on the planet. He top 20s nearly everything, but he's got just the one win on the resume. Like why 
why is Southern Hills better? Because it's harder? Because it might allow him to lean on his approach play and, and distance himself from the field that way, right? I think if you're either betting Connors or using Connors, the path to him finishing at the top of the leaderboard is very similar to Vicks, where he just goes out and his ball striking takes over, and that makes up for all his deficiencies and everyone else struggles with it. Yeah, I guess. I, I So I guess when it comes to so, – so what do we think is his ownership is? Because to me, to me, Connors is the same most weeks. Uh, so I only, I would rather just play him when no one else is going to play him instead of a week where he's going to be fairly popular. Here's the thing. I think he's going to be like 11% owned. Mm, that's interesting. That's a good number. It's a really good number. It's a really good number, actually. I mean, he played well at the Masters. Um, and always does. And always does. Like ah, Bay- 11's a, that's a really good number. <laughs> Bay-, Bay Hill's a really good course for me. Like almost like Zalatoris. Like these harder courses tend to favor the shittier putters. Yeah, uh, and 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 because they tend to also allow him to separate himself uh in the ball striking categories, which is which is which is good for Connors. Okay. 11% is probably the thing that's that sticks with me the most. Otherwise, like I, I just feel the same about him every single week. I just think he's like, yeah, he's like a good play every single week. And um, low ownership is the thing that kind of moves the needle for me. And I think that there's enough guys in this range that they're just going to evenly distribute a lot of it. Like we can talk about the Hattons and Brysons and Tigers. Like no one's using those guys. And we'll talk about Louie in a second. No one's really using Louie either. But between Homa, Connors, Finau, Fitzpatrick, like they're probably going to be pretty leveled off. And when push comes to shove, people are going to use Fitzpatrick. They always do. That's just the way that it works in major championships. So whatever his projection is, he's going to come in higher than that. And then because of the builds that we talked about and where the ownership is concentrating, whether it be Spieth, Thomas, Hideki, Cantlay, like those guys are going to be very popular. So is Lowry. So just when you're building out your lineups, you can do some dummy lineups and just put three of those guys in them. That leads everyone down to Keegan and Cameron Young, the mid sevens, the low sevens, the high sixes. This range can only support so much ownership. So I don't think that anyone really gets out of control here which is the thing and then louis comes in he'll be like now six seven eight percent i don't like him i'm not using him but i don't think that anyone gets crazy from here either i mean it's a it's a pretty compelling case right and uh i agree with you on what the most popular builds are going to be and if that comes true i I, like i'm warming pretty pretty heavily on Corey Connors. Uh, problem is there's another guy I like in this. I mean, I, I think you can flip a coin. You probably have to flip. I mean, it's between three guys. Maybe play some rock, paper, scissors and figure out who the winner is. Matt Fitzpatrick's next. Rates out great. Firm and fast. Short game. Long irons. Playing in the wind. It's the price. He's the new Paul Casey of majors in terms of DraftKings pricing. Yeah, the he. I don't want to say the free space, but like the free space, the guy that everyone's just like, oh, well, he's obviously you know six hundred dollars yeah, too cheap. He, he's he's going he's gonna to come thirteenth or maybe better, <laughs> right? Yeah, because he because he always does because he finishes inside the top twenty or the top ten of everything, and he's a better driver of the golf ball than people want to believe, and he's a very well rounded golfer, and he also gets the boost of like, oh, well, he's from uh, Europe, so he must know how to play in the wind, <laughs> and also oh, when it gets difficult, uh, that's when he starts to shine. It's not entirely wrong. Doesn't have a win on the PGA Tour. He's got, what, seven worldwide? I get it all. Like, he he should be an exciting option this week. And when you scroll down, it takes you a while to scroll to his name. A lot of people just click it. Finau is next. 80 to one wow. in some spots. I'm out on this guy, Pat. Reverse curse working in his favor. Another guy who, along with Daniel Berger, was tied for the lead after three rounds at Shinnecock Hills. And the driving is back, and every second week, the irons are back, like spike back. And then all of a sudden, how did he lose seven and a half strokes with his irons at Wells Fargo? How does that happen? He had a 15-shot difference from Mexico to the next week. He gained eight in Mexico, lost 7.7 at the Wells Fargo. 15-shot difference in one strokes gain category. I'm using Finau. I'm trying to think of a reason why. 
<laughs> really searching for it. That again, I think he kind of fits that ball striking mold. Pretty good player in the wind, by the way. Uh, his, his short game has kind of lost him, but it had been really good for a while. And these are the types of courses where I think that he can use his distance. He's going to be frustrating to play, but almost like a lot of these different ball strikers that we talked about, that he's one of the few players when we get to difficult courses. Like Brooks was like this, Dustin was like this, obviously Vic is like this, and Finau is a part of that same conversation. Is that when everyone else is making pars and bogeys he's gonna make his bogeys maybe make his doubles but he's gonna go out and score for you as well i like the way he's driving the ball last <laughs> five he's gained a ton of strokes off the tee i i see the spike week in both directions on approach right like excited about the ceiling week terrified about the floor week the short game historically iffy right it's been better recently a little bit iffy i i hate the non-quantifiable stuff but like there's just there's just no juice in this guy, Pat. Like when he gets into contention, it's just not happening. Yeah, you but know, you, seen, you don't you don't need him to win though. You don't. What do I need him to finish? T twelve. Yeah, T twelve or T seventeen, and outperform that position with birdies. Let's That's, look at his major championship stuff. Um, good at the Masters, generally speaking. Yeah, so his last handful of, of majors, 35th, 15th, missed cut, T8, T10, T38, T8, T4, third. Yeah, you get a lot of those, but those are a couple. I mean, his best stuff's all all, all behind him, I think. I don't know. I just, listen, I, I hope if he wins, it'd be an awesome story. I'd be happy for you. I don't necessarily see the breadcrumbs or the evidence that um, this is the week for him. Top 10s in both of the two past PGA championships. So there is that, you know, something to hold on to in this mix. I I'm going to be playing Finau. And I think that Connors, Fitzpatrick, Finau, I mean, you could play all three of them if you really wanted to. But I, I think that's an interesting little tier because after that, it gets really dicey for me. Webb Simpson is next. I don't want to play. You want to talk about a guy with no juice. This feels like the no juice play of the week. This is so bad, man. I, I love Webb, and he used to be so good, and we're just no, nowhere near, nowhere remotely close to the best version of, of Webb where he was awesome from fairway through green. We haven't sniffed it. We haven't seen signs of it. We have, like, just nothing. Zero evidence, zero juice. I'm sorry, Webb. I love you. I'm out. No finish better than T-35 in any of his starts. Obviously, he had been hurt for a while, and that was at the Masters. So, Webb, we're out. Answer, I'm also, until I see a return to form from the Mexican Allen Iverson, I'm just going to be out. And this doesn't feel like a great course for him anyway. Uh, no, it doesn't. It, it feels like he's like he could be overpowered here uh, quite a bit. And I don't, I, I, yeah, I not, not good enough frequently enough for me to be excited about this. Mark Leishman. This I will be in on at $7,700. Give me Aussies in the in the Texas slash Oklahoma wins. Aussies, all of a sudden, they just know what to do. Sandy courses, give me some Mark Leishman. I worry that he just hits it out of bounds and in the creek every <laughs> single time, but no ownership coming in on him and a pretty good track record at both Augusta and places with really tight lies in terms of chipping. I know the game isn't really there whatsoever, but it's also not as bad as people think either. No, it's not. And I, um, I agree. So, so Leishman who generally sprays it off the tee, I'm not worried about that because the, the rough, the rough here is, it's not that bad. It's not that penal. It's not going to be a big deal. Just avoid those, those creeks that run through a lot of the fairways. That's where I think you start getting into trouble, but I'm, I'm with you on, um, you know, this is way better than like a, like a, a wings foot setup for him or something like that. You know what I mean? So I, I, I agree that this is on the better side of, of setups for, for Leishman. And then he becomes just a pivot ownership play. Adam Scott is right here too at the same price. Another Aussie. I prefer Leishman over Scott, mainly because I know what Leishman does well and what Leishman doesn't do well. Like you mentioned, he sprays it all off the tee, but the putting can get super hot as Scott's can from time to time. But Leishman more consistent, very good around the greens, very good in the wind, very good in the sand, and the iron play has been consistent. Scott, it's almost like that Finau situation that we were talking about. Every other week, it's just something else is good. And the thing that was good, now that's bad all of a sudden. There's been zero consistency with his game. Yep. Last, uh, yeah, he two of his last four, he's lost off the tee. Two of his last four, he's lost on approach. Five of his last six, he's lost around the green. Three of his last four, he's lost with the putter. And they're seemingly different. We, it, it, It's just, it's bizarre. There's no uh, semblance of consistency with Adam Scott. And you're not even really getting good volatility good you know if there was no consistency but the weeks that he played well he would finish t3 or he'd win a golf tournament every now and then it's just 
I, we're not at that level. If you're gonna no. em, if you're gonna embrace the variance with one of these like late 30s, early 40s guys who were previously a good ball striker, former Masters champions. Not that I want to play him, but a cheaper Sergio just seems like a better better option than Adam Scott. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd even argue, and he doesn't have the Augusta National victory, but like Jason Day. Jason Day. Is big. <laughs> you want to talk about J Day? Yeah, we'll talk about J Day. Yeah, you want you go <laughs> light your fucking money on fire? I do it every week. Why would I not this week? <laughs> I I never play him, and sometimes it makes me look foolish, where I think that he's going to win a tournament, and then just he reverts back into this version of Jason Day. It's like, I mean, listen, I'm going to be putting money on Dustin in the hopes that he can get four rounds together, which he has not proven that he's been able to do at basically any time over the past 18 months. And now I'm sweating Jason Day at a cheaper price. I just think the upside for one, and you're paying the price for it, but I just don't see the upside in Jason Day when he's running well, like... I just, it seems unsustainable even when you're watching him play. <laughs> 10 of his last 12 rounds have been really good. Two have been horrible. And uh, one of them was a cold, wet TPC Potomac that I don't think I can kill him over. And even when he's been at his worst, he can show up for the PGA Championship. He's got like eight top 20s in a row. Obviously different golf courses, but that that type of setup where it's just, hey, it, you know, the winning score is probably going to be eight under par. Uh, you don't have to go out and make a bunch of birdies. You have a world-class field here. This is the best Jason Day's played in a while. That's what I'll say. I don't know if it's good enough, but it's the best he's played in a while. And uh, you're getting a significant ownership break on him because we have two chalky-ish guys coming in in this range. But I want to talk about Fleetwood first. I would. I don't know if I'm going to get to Tommy, but I'd rather play Tommy than Jason Day. Oh, interesting. Um, maybe because okay, so he's been so reliant on the short game uh, over his last handful of, of starts dating back to API, and that was horrible for last week. Where you like, if you're tapping into that, you're pretty screwed. Way better for this week. So I've been generally out on Fleetwood because of his reliance on the short game, but that's. That's one of the paths. So I, I don't I don't necessarily disagree with you that there's more upside in Fleetwood than than Jason Day at the moment. Um, here though, this is kind of like a, a a one day sale, right? Like it's Fleetwood this week. I'm not excited about him moving forward. He does have top twenties in three of his past four starts, and last week the ball striking did come together, and he lost the putter and he lost the chipping. And I mean, if there's ever a place to do it, that would probably be the place to do it, where you need to go and have a birdie fest. You want the driving, you want the irons to be firing now you need the other stuff to go with it if you actually want to win which he did not and not finished all that well but if you can get this scrambling figured out i just i remember how well he used to play at those really hard u.s opens those usga setups and while the rough isn't going to be as penal here obviously i do think that this type of layout the difficulty of the course and the wind does help him out yeah, I'm not ready to declare him that like 2017 version of, of U.S. Open Tommy Fleetwoods again, but this is definitely a better setup and definitely a better spot on the schedule for him than uh, I think the last couple have been and I think the next few will be. All right, let's go chalk, chalk, chalk before we just can kind of pick and choose a few guys that we want to go with. Cameron Young is first up on the list, $7,600. Tambo pointed this out to me. Is Cameron Young everyone someone everyone is talking about but doesn't end up playing, or is he going to be like 25% owned? Well, he was 25% owned at the Wells Fargo. He was 4% at the RBC Heritage. That was generally considered a pretty bad spot for him. 7.5% at the Masters, 85 at the Players, 17 at the API. I think it seems to be course dependent. Places that people think uh, bombers are going to play well, he tends to be more popular. But I'll tell you what, Pat, look at the results. I, I, mean, I, I see them. Oh, I see them. Riviera, Harbor Town, TPC Potomac, uh, Country Club of Jackson, four pretty different golf courses. I think this game travels. It does. Miscut at the players, miscut at the masters. So the two really big events that he's played in, he's missed the cut in both. Uh, and I think I played him in both those events. So that's a lot of fun for me. And I think I bet him to win both those events because I'm an idiot. But just looking at it, like the, the one thing... I can't quite reconcile with the putting has been really bad, but the chipping has been so good. Is he really this good around the greens or is it just a hot run? He's on. No, I think he's actually that good. He is. Um, it's, it's strange when bombers have good touch. There's not many that do, but he has multiple shots around the green. He can play it low. He can play kind of this mid little spinny thing. I, I actually believe he's a, a fairly good uh, around the green player. Doesn't, doesn't putt well, but uh, Hey, can't do everything. So, and the the weird part about the putting is that he also, for a guy who's like pretty good, like he's 
mediocre with his approaches versus his driving, which we know is going to be pretty on point the entire time. The around the green has been on point the entire time. The putter goes either way. The irons can kind of go either way too. So he's going to need that around the green game to really pick up because he's below average in terms of greens and regulation, which is really strange for a guy with, you know, four top three results this season. Yeah, that's and that's how strong his around the green play has been because he's 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 been forced to use it at times. Um, yeah, and for a guy who also hits a lot shorter clubs into a lot of these greens than everybody else does, so that that's a little bit weird that he misses as many greens as he does. But I'm I'm impressed. He's he's definitely our rookie of the year front runner in my opinion. Uh, you know, he played well at at Torrey Pines. He had a top twenty there. Th- all the other you know top three finishes. I I think this kid is is really, really special. And he's like the modern golfer, Pat. I I like the way he sets up moving forward. I think he may have talked me into eating a bit of the chalk there, and I hope it comes on in the low end, that he is someone I like. Obviously, the stats like him. If he can come in at like 12%, I mean, that's fine. I'm good with that. Keegan is up next. Keegan's going to be pretty popular, with good reason. He's been great. And he is a former PGA champion, so we will see him in this tournament for a lifetime, hopefully. Um, And he's just been showing up recently. I just feel like he's such a good fade whenever he's popular. Yeah, and especially coming off a uh, nearly ten strokes gained with the putter um, <laughs> at the like, I'll just take. I don't think he's going to do that again. Yeah, I I agree. This is a, a popular guy for good reason. But you look at the advanced metrics. So even the T eight at Valero uh, was one of his best around the green weeks. He gained like five point seven there. He gains nearly ten with the putter. One of his best putting weeks ever uh, in his other recent top ten. Then the Zurich. That's obviously a team event. Played well at the players, but like I, I mean, you could you could not give him as much credit as you want to for some of these outlier weeks. And the results I think look a lot better than maybe the deep dive into the advanced metrics do add in the fact that he's probably going to be popular. We'll play. I'll just play somebody else. Yeah. I think that he ends up between like 12 and 15%. I think he and Cameron Young are both very logical plays down in this range. And then there's the Gooch who I thought was going to be super popular, but the numbers just don't dictate it. And now I'm kind of being talked back into him. He's a very popular bet at uh at 100 to 1 and people bet him at 100 to 1 then he went up to 130 to 1 at DraftKings Sportsbook so I was like okay this is interesting and then I assumed he'd be like 15 16% owned on DraftKings it feels like every time he's in one of these big spots and he's chalk he lets everyone down and it seems like the ownership projections are factoring that in right now that people just have been burned by him in big spots before and they don't want to go back to him he's going to be like 6% I think he sets up really well yeah, 20, uh, 20% owned last week, missed the cut, loses 2.34 strokes on approach, which is his worst, oh boy, since the fall of last year. So, I mean, it is, it's is—it's an outlier week. And um, I don't like the Oklahoma narrative. I don't like that. But Gooch is a Oklahoma State guy who I know has has made some trips to, to Southern Hills here recently. Um, I, I like a bounce back as well, especially on a low ownership. A guy, when a guy has like a bottom 10 percentile, uh, approach week, which is a stat category that he's generally very good at. I don't think that that lasts forever. I think he kind of gets back to his back to his true form, and we see a better version of Gooch this time around. Billy Ho, yes or no? No for me. Yes for me. Really? Um, yeah, he's been he's been better than I think people want to remember. He's got a couple of wins in the last year. Um, he's never really been good at majors, but he's made eight straight cuts at PGA Championships. I. I'm terrified and I wouldn't want to watch every shot that Billy Horschel hits or, or at least listen in to every shot that Billy Horschel hits. But yeah, I, I think he's, I think he's shown me enough here recently that, that uh, I could be in on Billy. Okay. So I think we've ran through all the individual names that we need to do. Uh, let's just kind of go from 7,000 to 7,300. Cause that's who we have left in the $7,000 range guys that you like here. I personally, no shocker, like Siwoo and Luke List. I actually, I mean, Siwoo is just Siwoo, but I really do like Luke List. I think he kind of fits the narrative with what I've been talking about this entire time. Bad putter, that should be somewhat mitigated. The tee to green is still fine. He obviously has the distance. He's good around the greens. He's now essentially just a low rent Cameron Young. Uh, yes, list list would have been on on um, the short list of names that I mentioned there as well. The other one, the other one would have been Alex Norin, who um, since the start of the calendar year has been much better on approach, something he's never done in, in his career. And now we've got basically a dozen results of it to to kind of keep an eye on. And then 
Also, a uh, very grindy type player, you know, making par uh, for a good score often works for Alex Noren. His around the green play is always stout. The putter always good enough. Um, I, I like Alex Noren. He's a flat $7,000. I am in on Alex Noren as well. The other ones I have stars next to right now, whether I'm in or out, I haven't made the final decision. Siwoo was one of them. McNeely was one of them at $7,100. Matthew Wolf, 73 because I'm an idiot. Kokrak and Woodland were the other ones that I actually had significant interest interest in Russell Henley I should but I don't <laughs> yeah I'm, I feel the same way with Harold Varner the third like I should but I don't but so actually both of those guys last 24 rounds Henley's first in approach uh Varner is second and it's by a pretty wide margin over everybody else and Varner's got a couple of good results but man like do you tr- I, I just don't trust either of these guys right they have shown us uh, when they have gotten in contention the few times that they have they're often melting away which it, it's just it's just scary stuff the only ownership that you're going to run into in this range is probably Norin. And I don't even know how out of control that gets. Yeah, there's so many guys. I think there's like 36 golfers in the $7,000 range that it, I think it'll be fairly spread out. But uh, so I'm not, I'm not too concerned about one guy's uh, specific ownership here. $6,000 range. The more I look into the numbers, the more I like Johnny Vegas. So whatever that surgery he had a couple of weeks ago, like fixed up everything, man. He's just like, oh, I'll just come out and gain 10 strokes uh, on approach at the Wells Fargo. Um, Yeah, so what I like about Vegas is great ball striker, kind of streaky player in general, savvy vet. When you get to some of these like PGA championships and it's a big stage for a lot of these guys, Vegas, you know, doesn't have a lot of highlights on the resume, but he's been in the heat of the battle, which is always worth a little bit something, Pat. So I like him at 69. I like, we've talked about the savvy vets. I like Stuart Sink at $6,700. I just think that he hits so many greens in regulation. That's a big factor here. Don't expect him to win, but at the same time, you know, he's someone who can just, you know, plus two, plus two, make the cut. You know, plus two, plus two, and all of a sudden he's T31, and that's good enough uh, at $6,700 if you want to go this low. Mito, he ranks out so well for me. I, I don't know if I have the guts to pull the trigger, but I think I'm going to do it. Yeah, because he's marrying all the best stuff. He's like always been the great ball striker. Then he went through that stretch where he couldn't do that, but he could putt. And now he's kept a little bit of the putting and he's back to being a great ball striker. It's, dude, he's special, right? And winning's a skill. There's a reason why he got that battlefield promotion last year. And he's he's just an absolute flusher. And if you think, like there's a lot of hot takes around golfers in the wind, but like it basically comes down to just how often do you hit the center of the club face? And Mito hits it uh every single time Munoz Mito wise are shaping up to be the highest owned guys Cam champ as well people are in on Cam champ yeah major championship long layout people are going to be kind of excited about that that's not bad um there was oh can we talk about Kevin Na for a second sure I mean this is a big park for him but again I think a lot of it's in the threes and the fives he's been unreal on approach uh we know the short game is there he can get the hot Putter. I worry that it's a, it's a big park, but um, I, I want to be in on Kevin Nas stealing like two million bucks before he runs off to the Saudi League. He would be perfect with that Cam Smith, Jordan Spieth, uh, like that that sort of live Tyrrell Hatton, Kevin Na. Just throw all these guys in a lineup together and stack those skill sets because he's sort of like the minor league version of those guys because he doesn't hit it as far. Although he's great on approach, but that short game, the putting out of the sand, like you mentioned, I think he can really do that well. Chris Kirk will likely be somewhat owned. I'm out on that. You know, I've been playing around with the idea of Robert McIntyre. I think that makes some sense. He's been really good at major championships. I believe he's eight for eight in cuts made uh, in his career at major championships. And, you know, I like Bobby Mack, a big hit and lefty. And he's European, so you know he's great in the wind. The other ones, uh, Hughes and Cameron Davis, Mack Hughes, and Keith Mitchell. Obviously, Mack Hughes is more of the Kevin Na type, but back on bent, tough course. He just does his best work on things like that. And then Cam Davis and Keith Mitchell, Like if this does turn into a bomber's track, I kind of like them. Yeah, and Keith Mitchell, very streaky. Remember when he got out, he got like five shots ahead of everybody at Summit Club and he's gotten <laughs> on these hot runs before. I, I just love the way he drives the ball. He's got to kind of put four rounds together in, in all aspects. But um, yeah, I, I, I trust Keith Mitchell more than a lot of the guys in this in this range. And last one, I mean, we can talk about the Lonto Adam Hadwin kind of debate. It seems like there's not as much steam on those guys as expected. I still like Ryan Fox. Ryan Fox worldwide has been playing great. He is prestige worldwide, wide, wide, Ryan Fox. 
Yeah, he has. There's a couple of those guys. Sam, Sam Horsfield as well, who just won on the DP World Tour and and played in uh, the Zurich and made the cut as well. Like there are these some of these guys that are coming over from across the pond, obviously with their wind skills uh, in tow. Who um, I, I wouldn't rely on a bunch of them, and I I don't think their chances of winning are very high. But like, yeah, let's let's go get me a top. 22 and i'll be thrilled yeah fox bombs it as well uh he was another one who i actually played at shinnecock back in the day and played quite well for being ryan fox and being 6300 dollars. i don't think you need to go this low but if i'm gonna play 100 lineups i will go this low because you know I, I like playing guys and that's a lot of fun to me play the best plays before we get out of here seems like we've talked around who the best plays are going to be this week and i think it starts with do you think it starts with justin thomas or do you think the people go spieth hideki cantley Justin Thomas or Spieth Hideki, uh, it has to be Spieth Hideki Cantlay, right? Because I think because because I think JT I think is closer to some of the other guys in his price range, but the Spieth Hideki Cantlay thing also get like a Spieth, and Spieth and Hideki especially get the get the benefit of the pricing coming out early, and if this pricing would have come out like normal. Uh, they would be much more expensive. So I think the answer is the latter. So I think Norin is a very logical fit as the next man in at $7,000, leaving us seventy five and a half hundred dollars for a remaining two players. That means we can go Cam Young, Keegan Bradley if we wanted to. We could go Fitzpatrick and then someone just below the threshold of 7000 What do you think is going to be the more popular idea? Uh, Fitz and then somebody lower I think will be more popular. Okay, so Fitz, and it gives us $7,200. That gives us Rose, Reed, Sergio, Straka, Siwoo, List, Henley, Peters. List? Yeah. List? Do you think List will be that popular? Versus- no, but I, that's just my most, that's what I was most excited about. <laughs> oh, me, oh, me too. I, I would play List in this lineup. I'm just trying to think who are the people going to play in this lineup. Henley, probably? Uh, Henley is currently the highest projected one that I have, but it's like by fractions. Um, Over who? Sergio. Sergio could be like six percent. McNeely like six and a half. No, Those are the three that I have. Yeah, for me it is. Let's see here. It's actually list, but that's from Fantasy National, and Fantasy National will tell you Luke you list skew is, that. is. Yeah, I, I am going to skew that. That is a <laughs> that is a pretty on, on par Pat Mayo play if there ever was one. I'm trying to think. Is there anyone in these six thousands? That would work out? No, not really. Hmm. I'm just there's it's funny that the lower sevens aren't like loaded with just overwhelming ownership. Yeah, Russell Henley is the highest projected one. Russell Henley is the answer to this question. Yeah, Russell. So Russell Henley and that uses all the salary cap, which is very important. So Spieth, Hideki, Perfect. Cantley, Norin, Fitzpatrick, Henley, the play the best plays lineup right now. Do you think more people will go with the balance build or will they most definitely take someone over ten thousand? Ooh, good question. Um, whew. I think it's really appealing to start like Spieth, Xander, Hideki type thing. I will say more people go with a balanced build. I'm kind of on board with that too. I will be back Wednesday, noon Eastern time with Toe Tag and Tambo, Tyler Tambellini in studio, taking your questions live, finalizing everything, going over the final ownership, the weather, everything that you need. I will be here for you. So please bring your good questions, good questions only, and tune into that show. Set your reminders right now on the Mayo Media YouTube channel. You can catch it on demand on the podcast feed and the video feed after the fact. But here's the thing. If it's a podcast, Rick, and you've downloaded it and it's already done, can't ask live questions on those. Although people have asked me about that in the past, and I assume they have like brain injuries. So I don't be too hard on them. I, I think you should invent something that allows them to do that. Why have you not? I have a Let me submit the first question. Has anyone asked him what in the world toe tag and tambo means? That, listen, that can be the first one in the queue. I will ask him. I have no fucking idea. <laughs> I couldn't even, I can't even fathom. I can't even create a scenario in which pa that is a thing. I don't even know what that possibly could be. Paul seems to have the answer to this. What is it? Toe tagging means like you're, you're killing. You're killing the competition. Putting a toe tag on something means that like... <laughs> Like, it's like a murder scene. Well, as is evidence from... It's kind from, of strange, but as, like... as evidence from this conversation, Rick and I, not from the streets. <laughs> so he is So he is toe tag and tambo. He's out there killing the competition. I mean, he did he show off his full... Is. He showed off the full sleeve tattoo last week, so... I mean, Maybe he'll add the teardrop shortly. Yeah, well, we were talking about face tattoos. He's going to say he's going to stay away from that one. But yeah, I guess that's what it is. I guess that, that makes a lot of logical sense. 
You know, we cover golf for a living, Rick. Not not our scene. <laughs> I am not out there murdering them in the streets, unfortunately. Maybe someday. Maybe in another life. That's I mean, good, good stuff, though, Paul. I mean, he actually is murdering people in the DraftKings streets. Guy wins a ton of money, so uh, I guess that actually does make a lot of sense. I talk about MMA, so it makes it, I mean, <laughs> we, we cross these bridges a lot more often on the Dogger Pass. Right now, so. Well, I am going to go retreat to my white-collar home behind a picket fence where the security will keep everyone out away from me. This is not true. I live in the east coast of Canada. Those things do not exist where I'm from. Either way, play in the Listener's League. That is... Well, it's $15 to play, but the link is down in the description. Go do that. Sub to the newsletter. Get in those giveaways for the $100 giveaways by subbing, rating, and reviewing the Pat Mayo Experience audio podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Uh, and please go do that. As I mentioned earlier, and Rick said it too, that's the best way that you can help us out. And it takes literally like 20 seconds to do. And I'll give you money to go fucking do it. So please help us out. Rick, we're late in the week. We got Wednesday to go, and I mean, we're doing the cut. We're going to have rival cut sweat shows again, but what do you got coming out Tuesday night, Wednesday, and even Thursday? Yeah, so there's some stuff out on the Rick Rungood YouTube channel uh, already, live chat on on Wednesday, and um, I've got my newsletter coming out. So, you know, just follow me on Twitter at Rick Rungood, rickrungood.com, all that fun stuff. Sounds like you got a lot of the same stuff I got coming out. Yeah, that's how, how dare you? I invented, I invented a live chat and newsletter. I don't think I, anyone had ever thought of that before me. No, I, you, <laughs> I, I completely agree. So thanks for the, uh, thanks for the idea. I'm now profiting off of it. Yeah, it's not great that you do it better than me. That's not fair. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> oh, we'll see. All right, Rick. Thanks, dude, for coming on. I will see you again for the U.S. Open as we go player by player. I hope Vic wins for the both of us. Oh my God. If Victor wins, I'll be one super rich and just super very excited for him. So that'll be, that'll be great. Will you fly in and streak on the course and hug him if he wins? Uh, Yes. If he, if he's in, I will not streak on and hug him, but if, if he was in contention on Sunday, I'd probably fly there. And then if he won it, I mean, I would be like, like turn the jet to Vegas. Like let's, let's celebrate this for real. Hey, it would get you a free trip home on his private jet too. That'd be nice. Yeah, he's yeah, that would be nice. Thanks. Wheels up or net jets or whoever whoever wants to sponsor that. <laughs> All right. At Rick Run Good on YouTube, Twitter, and RickRunGood.com. Great tools up there as well. So please go check that out. Plus, I'll have his prize picks, as will Tambo and I for the PGA Championship, which is always a good time. That will do it for me. I will be back noon Eastern, like I mentioned, on Wednesday with Tambo taking your questions. Until then, smash the like, and I'll see you next time. Experience. Experience!